Let's take a breath together. <sighs> so this, this is the last week of our series of living everyday wonder as relationships. And this morning our talk title is The One and Only. And it is perhaps the most idealistic, feel-good concept and the hardest one to get and actually live by. Because here's the thing. Even in quoting our founder, Ernest Holmes, there's a tendency to misquote one of his most profound quotes and create a degree of separation. Most coming up in science of mind, what I heard over and over again is there is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. That is not what Ernest Holmes said. And it wasn't until ministerial school that I'm like, huh, that's different. So whatever word works for you for God, plug that in. Because no matter what we call it, it's just a name. It's our idea of it. What Ernest Holmes actually said is there is only one life. That life is God. God is my life now. That's very different than God's life and my life. Very different. And many of us, you know, in, in my talk notes, I have to laugh at myself sometimes. Because even in my notes it says, you can't say you love God and hate others. You can't say you believe in an equitable, just society and treat other people poorly. Well, fact in the human realm is, yes, you can. You can say those things and do those things because don't we do that all the time to some degree? We say we love, but then we have our special people <laughs> who, if we're telling the truth, when they cross our mind, none of our thoughts are loving. They're just not. There are groups of people that even though many of us say we stand for justice, equity, there are people that cross our mind that somehow we exclude. Mostly because we deem them to be so unjust they don't deserve justice. It's an interesting way to think. So, if we really understand that there's only one, that we are it, then we begin to understand that every moment of every relationship is communion with the divine. That it is quite impossible for you to relate to anyone or anything it isn't that. Whether we call it God, Spirit, the One, the Infinite, the Beloved, the Divine, if that is all there is, which quantum physics certainly points to, then it's quite impossible for any of us to ever interact or relate to Anything other than that. So how do we get there? Because I don't know about you, but this thing called behavior kind of gets in the way sometimes. Because we have the capacity. We have, each, each and every one of us, no one is exempt from this. We all have the capacity. We have the freedom. We have the ability. And many of us, until we begin to examine, we have the propensity to behave badly, to behave selfishly, to behave, dare I say, humanly, to behave in duality, 
to behave in me first, which requires me to have some degree of confusion about oneness that I even think there is a me. And yet, we are here on planet Earth in a physical realm where everything is experienced as separate. And so perhaps the greatest spiritual practice available to us is a practice of wholeness, is a practice of conscious, intentional oneness. That no matter what's happening in the physical realm, we insist on seeing God in everybody, in everything. That we, you know, Ernest Holmes, we, for those of you not familiar with the organization of Centers for Spiritual Living, we have an ecclesiastical body known as licensed practitioners. And licensed practitioners go through a ton of training to help us remember who we are, to help us remember the truth when we forget. And before you can be a minister, you have to be a practitioner. And it is really a deep excavation of the thoughts that get in our way. Ernest Holmes said everyone who practices science of mind is a practitioner. So all we're really talking about is the difference between practitioners that have a license and practitioners who don't have a license. Because if we are going to do what is offered to us, a science of mind, a philosophy, a faith, and where the rubber meets the road, a way of life. And it really does, my experience is it really does come in those stages. That first I learn it as a philosophy. And then as I begin to practice it, I build my faith muscle. Because faith demands that I know it at an unseen level. That I know that I am infinite intelligence in form. So if, if I really know that, then I know that every answer I'm looking for, I already know. And then I'm about the business of What's blocking it? What's blocking me from knowing what I know? If I am love, pure love in form, and I have a moment of anything other than love, what is that? What is that? And this is how we heal all this is how we get back to wholeness. Because in oneness, you wrap your mind around this. In oneness, what we heal any place, we heal every place. It can't be any other way in oneness. And all too often, when we think about healing consciousness, we're figuring out how to heal somebody else's consciousness. Well, the first thing that we have to heal is the distortion that there's your consciousness and my consciousness. <laughs> there's just consciousness. And we're all using it. And how we use it impacts the whole. How we use it impacts the whole. It is a deep dive into embracing the spiritual wholeness, the truth of spiritual wholeness, that even in the most reprehensible human moments, will we invite and allow ourselves to look beyond the behavior, not dismiss it. No part of me is suggesting that we ignore bad behavior but that we look beyond it and we know at a level of kinship that there's more there. 
that there is just like there's the capacity for us to act the way we think is most reprehensible on someone else, that there is equally the capacity in them to be 100% godlike. Because that's what will manifest when we focus our attention there. Deborah and I were talking yesterday about the analogy that we often use in science of mind of the seed, the soil, and the plant. And when we plant regular plants, physical plants, right, we plant the seed, and then we have to water them consistently for a period of time. Because if you just plant the seed and you water it the first day, and then you forget about it, chances are it's not going to grow. <laughs> right? It needs watering every day. And Deborah asked what I think is a brilliant question. So in that seed, soil, plant analogy, what's the water? Okay. It's our attention. It's our attention. And so when we plant a mental seed, do we just plant it and then move on to the next thing? Or do we maintain a focus on it? Do we plant it mentally and then commit our attention to it? Continue to bring our energy, not to, is it growing yet? Because that's the other thing we do, right? We plant and then we give it a little bit of water, and then we keep consciously digging it up to see if it's bloomed yet. <laughs> Try that with your tomatoes. Let me know how it works. Go out every 20 minutes and dig it up and see if it's working. It, you, we kill them because what we're really doing is focusing on our doubt. See, instead of watering the seed of our intention, we're watering our doubt when we do that. And so what if every time you thought about that thought that you're working on shifting, you anchored into that. That I know within my being that what is true is that God is all there is. And it is manifesting itself in form. And you just keep bringing your focus back. And you keep bringing your focus back. And before long, all of a sudden, you're going to notice something has changed. Something has sprouted within you. And that tender cotyledon is your new thought. And so then you focus with literally awe and wonder. Just like you would in your garden. You know, the first time, and many of us as kids, the first time you grew a garden, and that little booger popped up, and you're like, whoa! That childlike awe and wonder. Have that with your thoughts. So that when you notice that your thought is shifting, up, fertilize. Fertilize your attention. And meet it with awe and wonder. And allow yourself to, where is this going? What is it going to look like as it grows? Allow yourself to be curious. Stop scripting your limited outcome. Because here's the thing, folks. The only scripting we can do is from the past. We can't script from newness. Newness is something we experience. Scripting from the past is a limitation. Why would we do that? No. If you've only ever gotten tomatoes this big, are you willing to have tomatoes this big? Are you willing to be amazed at what life is unfolding as you? Beyond your wildest expectations. Those of us in 12-step recovery know well 
Because if we had scripted what sobriety would be like, we would have sold ourselves so short. Because we couldn't imagine life being amazing. We just couldn't. Because it had been so unamazing for so long. The only, at best, it could stop hurting so bad. But there was no place where we could imagine. The, oh my God, this is awesome. And that's what we get. And it's all about spiritual practice. And so I invite you. Number one. Understand that everything is holy. There is, you know, this whole, the sacred and the mundane, they're one and the same. Because if God is all there is, I don't think there's a place of a mundane God. I don't see it happening. And so, begin to expand everything, everybody, every moment is sacred. Empower your choice. Number two, choose how you see life. Because that's how you'll see it. If you see it as dualistic, if you see it as divided, that is how you will experience it. If you choose, consciously, intentionally, choose oneness, that's what you'll experience. And it'll blow your mind. It'll blow your mind. And third, gratitude. When you have those moments, when you notice the tiniest of shifts, celebrate it. Throw an insanely wild party. <laughs> Fertilize it. Celebrate it. Own it. And then... Go back to step one. No, there's more. Know that as amazing as this moment is, the next moment is even more amazing. And keep that energy of excitement. Keep that curiosity of that childlike awe and wonder. And just allow yourself to choose. And then choose. And then choose it. Let's take a moment of prayer. Ah, what I know <laughs> is that there is only one. By whatever name we call it, one. That all life is it in form. All life. All thoughts, all being, all form, all experience. This one divine, perfect substance. Simultaneously the source, the activity, and the creation. So I must do that. And in the truth of oneness, what is true of me must be true of all. And so God and only God, love and only love, holy and only holy is all there is. And so I speak a word that each expression, each one of us remembers over and over again, the divine power of choice. That one element that is divinely given not to separate creation from its creator, but to empower its way home. Choice. The choice to know. The choice to relate to all life. That's the truth of me. The choice to celebrate. The choice to live in that state of awe and wonder, of wholeness, 
childlike curiosity. The choice to allow ourselves to be wowed beyond our wildest imaginings. To know that everything that wows us is us. So grateful. And so it is from this place of gratitude, from this place of celebration, from this place of awe and wonder that I release my word knowing it is the word of the infinite speaking itself into being. Nothing to do but let it go. And so I do. I invite you to know the word spoken is you speaking as well. To own it as we say together. And so it is.